The cure to greed is not an economic system. Not at all. The cure to greed is a changed heart. And that changed heart, according to the Christian faith, comes when the Holy Spirit does a work in our heart. It doesn't come from reading a book. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. Kenneth G. Elzinga, the Robert C. Taylor Professor of Economics at the University of Virginia, delivered a plenary address as part of Acton University 2018. His topic for the evening was C.S. Lewis and Freedom. Christianity's most famous apologist meets Adam Smith. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. to introduce our speaker this evening, someone I hold in high regard professionally and personally. Kenneth G. Elzinga is the Robert C. Taylor Professor of Economics at the University of Virginia. He has received numerous teaching awards, and each fall his introductory economics course attracts over 1,000 students, making it the largest class offered at the University of Virginia. Consequently, He has taught over 45,000 students so far in his career. You might be... You might be surprised in light of all of that and his many and varied accomplishments that his students call him Mr. Elzinga. It is with the humility appropriate for lifelong learning as recommended by the university's founder, Thomas Jefferson, that the professors at UVA have traditionally been called Mr. or Ms. It is also a humility that Mr. Elzinga epitomizes. In his scholarly work, Mr. Elzinga is an expert in antitrust economics. He has testified in several precedent-setting antitrust cases, including three Supreme Court decisions. The author of more than 70 academic publications, Mr. Elzinga also is known for his mystery novels written under the pen name Marshall Jevons, in which the protagonist employs economic analysis to solve crimes. Mr. Elzinga has served on the boards of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, Hope College, and the Center for Christian Study at UVA. He is active in ministry to college students, including a weekly discipleship group for young men at UVA. Mr. Elzinga has a BA, an honorary doctorate from Kalamazoo College, a PhD from Michigan State University, and an honorary doctorate from Gordon College. On a personal note, I have to admit, I was pretty excited to see Ken listed as one of the plenaries this week. Uh, I had the privilege of serving as Ken's head teaching assistant in those large 1,000 student classes for two years in a row. And uh, by my calculation, that means I have observed his excellent teaching for hundreds of hours. So I can say with complete confidence that we are in for a treat tonight. Would you join me in uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Ken Elzinga to the lectern? Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Sarah. Um, Father Sirico said last night that there are over 70 nations represented here. I find that a remarkable statement. And I want to speak to those of you who are not from the United States and for whom this sort of conference might be quite new. There's a custom in the United States when a speaker gets up to address a group where the speaker says, it's a delight to be here, or it's a great pleasure to be here. Now, usually, that's a total fabrication. (laughs) The speaker, truth be told, would rather be at the beach, or with his or her family, or with friends having a meal. But in my case, it really is a pleasure to be here, as well as an honor. Um, 
I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing this evening than sharing these remarks with you. Christianity and freedom, that's the topic I plan to address. And I'm going to make two contentions. The first is that the philosophy of C.S. Lewis, who is believed by many to be the premier Christian apologist of the 20th century, fits comfortably within what Adam Smith called the obvious and simple system of natural liberty. And that the practice of Christianity by followers of Jesus poses no threat to individual freedom. In fact, I'm going to argue that the Christian faith, as it was espoused and defended by Lewis, is a bulwark for the protection of liberty. And it's a natural ally of free market conservatives and libertarians against the Leviathan state. My second contention is that as one digs into Lewis's writings and you drill right down to the foundation in the life and teachings of Jesus, one continues to find a theology that squares with Adam Smith's obvious and simple system of natural liberty. Now this means that those who use the Christian faith as a lever for government programs to rig the market, uh, to confiscate wealth, or to foster class conflict, do so by distorting the life and teachings of Jesus. Or to put it differently, libertarians and free market conservatives ought to be people who welcome the Christian gospel because it's about freedom. Now these are portmanteau expressions and they require unpacking. And I don't have much time to unpack them in detail and I want to leave time for questions and discussions. So if you have a seat belt, you should fasten it. Let's start with Lewis himself. In 1943, during the height of World War II, Lewis was asked for his views on democracy. Now at the time he was teaching at Oxford as well as speaking to student and military groups and, and, and recording talks that were broadcast for the morale of soldiers. And these were talks that explained the elements of the Christian faith and that would later become the basis for Lewis's famous description and defense of the Christian faith, a book entitled Mere Christianity. Now because England at the time was locked in a desperate struggle with the totalitarian regime of Nazi Germany, many assumed that Lewis, when he gave his views on democracy, would give a flag-waving, ringing affirmation of democracy in general, and probably of Great Britain in particular. But this wasn't the case. Let me read a portion of what Lewis wrote. I am a Democrat, small d Democrat, because I believe in the fall of man. I think most people are Democrats for the opposite reason, a great deal of democratic enthusiasm descends from the ideas of people like Rousseau, who believed in democracy because they thought mankind so wise and good that everyone deserved a share in the government. The danger of defending democracy on those grounds is that they're not true. I find that they're not true without looking further than myself. I don't deserve a share in governing a hen roost, much less a nation. <laughs> Nor do most people. The real reason for democracy is just the reverse. Mankind is so fallen that no man can be trusted with unchecked power over his fellows. Aristotle said that some people were only fit to be slaves. I don't contradict him, but I reject slavery because I see no men fit to be masters. Lewis's point is that in a fallen world, democracy may be our best option for governing, not only because men shouldn't be servants, but because no one is fit to be a master. And his reflections on government and authority echo that of Lord Acton's observation. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I'm not sure what this says about me, but over the course of my career as a professor at the University of Virginia, I've been approached by three political parties to run for Congress, Democratic, Republican, and Libertarian. When, when C.S. Lewis was approached by men with similar political objection, ambitions for him, he proposed, and maybe this was with tongue in cheek, the creation of an entirely new political party. Here's what he wrote. Could one start a stagnation party? 
which at general elections would boast that during its term of office, no event of the least importance had taken place. Now, Lewis, Lewis had no... Lewis had no training in economics, but his views on what he believed to be the fallen nature of man left him uncomfortable when men were given control over the lives and the property of others. He viewed limited government as a necessary evil. Lewis was quick to point out that for the human condition, government was medicine, not food. Listen to this very profound quote and note the strain of libertarianism within it. Of all the tyrannies, a tyranny exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It may be better to live under robber barons than under moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end. For they do so with the approval of their conscience. To be cured against one's will and cured of states which we may not regard as a disease is to be put on a level of those who have not yet reached the age of reason or those who never will. Hayek wrote about what he famously called the fatal conceit, which Hayek understood to be at the taproot central planning. Lewis came to the same conclusion that the promises of central planning were a fatal conceit, but Lewis came at this from a different angle, centering his observation on the book of Genesis and the Reformation doctrine of the fallen nature of man. Lewis wrote that all that can really happen under socialism is that some men will take charge of the destiny of others. They will be simply men, none perfect, some greedy, cruel, and dishonest. The more completely we are planned, the more powerful they will be. Have we discovered some new reason why this time power should not corrupt as it has always done before? In writing about the welfare state, Lewis was as blunt as any free market conservative or libertarian. Listen to this. The question has become whether we can discover any way of submitting to the worldwide paternalism of a technocracy without losing all personal privacy and independence. In other words, is there any possibility of getting the welfare state's honey and avoiding the sting? Let us make no mistake about the sting. To live his life in his own way, to call his house his castle, to enjoy the fruits of his own labor, to educate his children as his conscience directs, to save for their prosperity after his death, these are wishes deeply ingrained in civilized man. I want you to note closely Lewis's words here. He is not writing about the benefits of a free society for the elites, the students that he taught at Oxford and Cambridge. He's not writing about the benefits of a free society for his illustrious literary friends like J.R.R. Tolkien and Dorothy Sayers. Lewis is writing about ordinary Englishmen. For ordinary Englishmen who would not be studying at Oxford or Cambridge or be engaged in the writing of books. As a Christian, as one who viewed all men created in God's image and therefore of great value, Lewis wanted for ordinary people a world in which their home was their castle, where the fruits of their labor, however modest, would not be taxed away, and where their children were seen as theirs to raise in accord with their conscience, not the state's, and where inheritances were seen as property to be protected by the state, not confiscated by the state. Lewis, to my knowledge, never used the word libertarian or conservative to describe an ideology. Uh, as a consummate wordsmith, he probably would not have liked either term. As a follower of Jesus, Lewis thought more in a biblical taxonomy. He did, however, use the term freeborn. Freeborn. Lewis wrote, I believe a man is happier and happy in a richer way if he had a freeborn mind. But I doubt whether he can have this without economic independence. For economic independence allows an education not controlled by government. 
And in adult life, it's the man who needs and asks nothing of government, who can criticize its acts and snap his fingers at its ideology. Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, is very popular among the political left. Finally, they say, someone has made a data-dense, clinically dispassionate case for government-sponsored, government-mandated economic equality. An economic case for higher tax rates on the wealthy to make the poor less poor. Lewis would have seen through this in a minute. He wrote, when equality is treated not as a medicine or a safety gadget, but as an ideal, we begin to breed that stunted and envious state of mind which hates all superiority. That mind is a special disease of democracy. It will kill us all if it grows unchecked. And Lewis added this, every intrusion of the spirit that says, I'm as good as you, into our personal and spiritual life is to be resisted as every intrusion of bureaucracy or privilege into our politics. Lewis concluded, God's love for us is not measured by our social rank or our intellectual talents. If there is to be equality, it is in his love, not in us. Lewis even put arguments for governmental intrusions into the mouths of devils. Lewis's demonic protagonist in the screw tape letters notes with satisfaction that government sponsored class envy was placing people's feet quite effectively on the road to hell. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia attract readers of all ages. Can you think of other books that have been read across a wider spectrum of ages? Now, I'm going to take an aside here that's not in my prepared mark remarks. I happen to know and is a friend of the man who bought Lewis's wardrobe that Lewis grew up with as a child and brought it to the United States. And Father Sirico, I can barely see you over here. It was a free market transaction. It was bought at an auction. <laughs> Buyers were symmetrically informed on both sides of the deal. And you can go and see this wardrobe now in the Marion Wade connection, collection uh, next to Wheaton College. I've been there many times. It's remarkable to go there when there is a child with you who has read the Chronicles of Narnia. When they see the wardrobe, their eyes become as big as saucers. Something magical is about to happen. Now, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's a scene in which the Pevensey children have become king and queen. And Lewis describes their kingdom this way. And they made good laws and kept the peace and generally stopped busybodies and interferers and encouraged ordinary people who wanted to live and let live. Now, Lewis never pretended to be an economist, but he knew that economic utopias of the sort that bedeviled his century, the 20th century, had a disturbing propensity either to fail or they required enforcement at the point of a gun. He also would have contended that anyone who believed in economic freedom's ability to produce a heaven on earth was sadly mistaken. While many professors in the humanities were drawn to Rousseau and the natural goodness of man, Lewis believed in the fall of Adam and the expulsion from the garden. And like a good economist, Lewis understood that poverty, not prosperity, was the natural order of things. Millions have died at the hand of central planning. No one has died as a result of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Now, there's a singer, and here I'm going to date myself, but at my age, that happens every day. A singer named Frank Sinatra, who was very much identified with Las Vegas, and he had a famous theme song entitled, My Way. And if you're in the audience and you have no idea who Frank Sinatra is, he once was as big as the Beatles. And if you don't know who the Beatles are, they once were as big as Beyonce. <laughs> now, consider the two words that comprise the title of Frank Sinatra's theme song, My Way. Then think about the two most famous words of Jesus, follow me. What a stark contrast. Frank Sinatra sings My Way, but the Bible teaches, if I may impose some King James Version language on you, there is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 
or in a more modern translation, there is a way, note that word way again, that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. The scriptures of the Christian faith don't square with a philosophy of my way. Let me illustrate. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord establishes his steps. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The promotion of ourselves, the pursuit of our own desires, the I did it my way embodied in the Frank Sinatra song can run rampant in a free market. So what's the problem with free market capitalism? Certainly not that it doesn't deliver the goods. It does. Certainly not that it requires greed. It doesn't. When G.K. Chesterton was asked what's wrong with the world, he replied, I am. What's wrong with the market system is that it's populated with people like us, people who come to believe that it is by our might and our power that things are accomplished. And here's the rub. Because the market system is such an extraordinary engine of abundance for so many people, there are all too many who can be be deluded into thinking, I did this. And into this ostensibly libertarian proposition comes the gospel of Jesus Christ that claims freedom is to be found in following Jesus. Now, many of my students at the University of Virginia are puzzled over this. How can following someone else lead to freedom? And the short answer would be never, unless unless the person you're following holds the keys to abundant life. And that's one of the claims of Jesus Christ. He said, I have come that you can have life more abundantly. Now, did you ever think about how remarkable is the name Adam Smith? According to the Bible, Adam was the first man. Smith is the most common surname, the most common surname in the English language. So when Adam writes the most famous book about economics, and it's about the economic flourishing, not of kings and potentates, not of religious and political authorities, but about how ordinary people, the Smiths of the world, might prosper through what Adam Smith called an obvious and simple system of natural liberty. The strength and the weakness of Smith's obvious and simple system of natural liberty are two sides of the same coin. Its strength is how free markets improve our standard of living in a fashion that is freedom compatible. When Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, the experience of most people over the whole span of mankind's existence was one of grinding, hopeless poverty. Poverty with no relief, Poverty with no expectation of improvement. And Smith decided to explore and explain the aberrations, how some nations managed to escape this fate. Hence the full title of Smith's masterpiece, an inquiry into the nature and the causes of the wealth of nations. But on the other side of the coin is that the free market makes no promise of changed hearts for the common people. A free society by definition, allows human virtues such as these to be exercised, but a free society cannot require or mandate changed hearts. Libertarians and free market conservatives care about freedom, as does the Christian faith. Consider the following words of Jesus. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. These words can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 32. They can likewise be seen engraved upon the front of Cabell Hall at the University of Virginia, where I teach, and many, many other buildings at colleges and universities. The truth shall set you free is an expression that would seem laudable in any university setting. What would separate Christians from many libertarians What would give C.S. Lewis pause about many libertarians is what happens when you put these famous words of Jesus in context. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free is the tail end of the expression that gets inscribed on buildings at colleges and universities. The front end 
rarely gets inscribed. But Jesus began by saying, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Before he adds, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You see, Lewis understood and believed something that would be a hard pill to swallow for anyone who conflates liberty with doing their own thing. The paradox of the Christian gospel is that we're most free when we're doing what we were created to do. And according to Jesus, that means abiding, abiding in his word. Now, abiding is not a common word in today's parlance. Most of my students at the University of Virginia never use that word. Abide means living with. And because Christians believe Jesus has been raised from the dead and lives today through his spirit, then Jesus' words abide make sense. And Jesus explains what abiding means. It means abiding in his word, following his teachings. And therein lies the rub between Jesus and many libertarians. Libertarians believe in freedom, a freedom from guidelines, from control, that anything, from anything that stands in the way of their own desires and pursuits. They want to be in control of their own lives. The poem Invictus, do you know that poem? Has a famous part that goes like this. This is the part most people know of the whole poem. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I'm the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now, if those words stir your cocoa, you probably will balk at the metaphor of abiding in God's word or the idea of following Jesus. And therein also lies the rub with many people between Jesus and many people on the left. Indeed, for people on the left, this teaching of Jesus is even more problematic than it is for many libertarians because socialists and central planners are often those who seek power over others and whose desire is that the others would follow the dictates of the modern state, not the spirit of God, which Jesus Christ claims will make one truly free. So there you have it, an age-old divide that goes back to the beginning of recorded history, a divide that goes back to the story of Adam and Eve. It's a question of authority. Whose authority are we under? And it's also a question of freedom. Is freedom to be valued? Libertarians, free market conservatives would say yes. If only the government would leave us alone to make our own decisions and voluntarily trade with others. But the purpose of that freedom, this is the fork in the road for libertarians who are secular and those who are not. The secular libertarian says the purpose is what I want to make it to be. I'm to be the captain of my soul. And the person who's a follower of Jesus says something very different. This person says, no, I've been created for something higher and better than my own narrow desires. True freedom comes through my doing what God has called me to do. Being what he originally created me and all of humanity to be. Someone who loves and glorifies God in both his work and his life. Someone who, with God's help, is learning how to love his or her neighbor as himself or herself. Then do Jesus' words ring true. One can know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Making the same point about liberty, the apostle Peter wrote, Live as free men, but don't let you use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. What sets the freedom of Jesus apart from the freedom of Ayn Rand, from the freedom of Milton Friedman, from the freedom of Ludwig von Mises, from the freedom of Friedrich Hayek, from the freedom of Murray Rothbard, is that freedom in Christ is freedom from bondage, not to the state, but to us. The Christian gospel cannot be well understood without understanding the Old Testament scriptures. And the Old Testament has two accounts that would have been very familiar to C.S. Lewis. The first is the exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt by God's miraculous provision. For an Israelite living under the rule of Pharaoh was a libertarian and free market conservative's nightmare. And God thought it was a nightmare too. So he delivered the Israelites from bondage. Chalk one up for freedom. The second is the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments. 
to Moses on Mount Sinai. This also involved the liberation of the people of Israel, but in a very different fashion. For while the exodus from Egypt meant freedom from slavery, the giving of the law meant a freedom for something greater. When God provided the law, he also gave the Israelites the freedom, the freedom to obey or not obey his commands. And the freedom enabled by the exodus reaches its potential when it's tied to obedience to the precepts that we were created to follow. Libertarians and free market conservatives are those who distrust the authority of the state to govern important aspects of their lives. And they distrust this for good reason, because the state is not knowledgeable or trustworthy to do so. But Christians are those who believe that the God of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who created the earth and set the stars in place, the God who made us and seeks to redeem us, that God is knowledgeable enough and trustworthy enough to have dominion over us. Lewis would argue that becoming followers of Jesus is not to deny our identity as individuals. Rather, it is to complete it. The connection lost in Eden is regained. And when the shackles of sin are removed from our ankles, we're free to rise, free to go forth, free to follow Jesus as Lord. Ask yourself this question, who is freer than the person who chooses to serve? Now, free market economists like me spend hours trying to persuade students that there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. We have an acronym for this, TANSTAFFEL. But the Christian gospel lives in tension with that economic principle. The Christian faith not only makes the claim that true freedom comes through Jesus Christ, there's no charge to have this freedom. It's a gift from God. And it's a gift, if I may use business jargon, with a very long shelf life. The freedom of Rand, the freedom of Friedman, the freedom of Mises, the freedom of Hayek, the freedom of Rothbard, hold out the prospect of a temporal freedom. If only the modern nation state can be pushed back. But the teaching of Jesus offers a freedom beyond the grave. Jesus did what none of these great apostles of freedom could do defeating the one enemy that we're all not free from, death. Freedom in Christ is freedom ultimately from death. But that freedom can be experienced on earth by living in obedience to his teachings. Now, I'm about to draw my talk to a close. When I was an undergraduate student at Kalamazoo College, my speech teacher told me, I was called Kenny then, Kenny, when you're getting near the end of your talk, always let your audience know that. She didn't say that to the other students, and I puzzled over that. <laughs> and she said, well, Kenny, you need to do that because it, it will revive hope among your audience. <laughs> so I'm getting near the close of my remarks. C.S. Lewis became a Christian after he was a famous scholar. Uh, most of you probably know that. You may not know that he described himself as a reluctant convert. Writing about his coming to faith, he didn't use the word liberty, he used the word liberation. And Lewis wrote, that's a very profound part of Lewis's writings, and I don't pretend to fully understand the depths of it. Lewis wrote, the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men. And God's compulsion is our liberation. The Christian gospel tells us what to do with that liberation. It's not the poem Invictus. It's not Sinatra's My Way. It is rather to know God and enjoy him forever, to love God and to love our neighbors. Now, I've quoted a lot of Lewis in this talk. Let me close by quoting something Father Sirico wrote, words that are very Lewisian. When freedom is divorced from faith, both freedom and faith suffer. Freedom becomes rudderless because truth gives freedom its direction. And where does truth come from? 
That was the famous question of Pontius Pilate, wasn't it? The Christian faith claims that truth comes from the life and teachings of Jesus, who had the temerity to say that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for your attention. I understand we may have time for questions. Thank you so much. And we already have some great questions coming in. So maybe we can start with a question on Lewis. This question reads, C.S. Lewis was a profound evangelist and spoke eloquently on freedom. Who is the C.S. Lewis of our day? <laughs> so the flippant answer I'll give is I wish there were the Lewis of today. The <laughs> I'll give you my experience as a college professor, so I'm really limited to a very small data set here, a non-random sample of one. Um, and I promise not to turn this into a shaggy dog story, but I'm intensely interested in the evangelism of this generation of students that I teach. I've always had a heart for evangelism. And for a long time, I would propose to students who were seeking the Christian faith uh, two books. One was Basic Christianity by John Stott, and the other was Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And over and again, I saw the fruits of these two books early on. It's, and these books are still valuable. Please don't get me wrong. But I have found that the current generation of students has difficulty reading Mere Christianity. They, they find it tough sledding. And I'm teaching kids at, at a good university. I mean, these are kids who are smart and get into the University of Virginia. It's a selective school. But something has happened in the way people read, in my observation, and they have a harder time reading, even though mere Christianity, to my mind, is brilliantly written. A book that I find resonates with students more, or at least many students, is Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. And the book is interesting in that it, Strobel is a journalist, essentially, uh, who became a Christian. And, and, and the apologetics in the book is more a narrative of people who have become Christians. And students of this generation seem to connect more with that. Now, Lee Strobel would be tremendously embarrassed if I were to say he's today's C.S. Lewis. Uh, and, and, and he's not in some sense. But it is a book that people are reading and finding a, 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 an apologetic of the Christian faith for their generation. There are others as well, but where I see evangelism taking place more now is through the context of what Becky Pippert in a book called Out of the Salt Shaker is, is more like a relational evangelism. Uh, and I think that's in part because a lot of today's students just aren't as connected with the kind of apologetics, uh, the sort of brick by brick layering of logic that you find in mere Christianity. Uh, coming to Christ for them is often more relational. They come to Christ and later they develop a theology <laughs> instead of developing a theology and saying, oh, that makes so much sense that I'm going to follow Jesus. It's more a revised sequence of sorts. I follow Jesus and I'm in Christian community and the teachings and doctrines and precepts of the Christian faith become something I believe. Now as a professor, that's a strange thing for me. I'm used to trying to teach and make an argument. People find the argument persuasive and they follow the logic of it. But I do find with many students today a, a revised sequence and, 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 and I, I just have to look and wonder at that and say, Lord, thank you for working in your ways with this generation. I think many of us appreciated your ability to draw on scripture. Not everyone expects that from an economist. Uh, so thank you for that. We actually have a question about uh, St. Paul and his understanding of freedom. Is that understanding different from the libertarian view of freedom? When, when I think of the Apostle Paul, in, in, in sort of my view as an economist who teaches a lot about free markets, the thing that strikes me the most about Paul is how he often begins his letters. Now, he could start the way a lot of academics would. 
very impressive resume, student of Gamaliel, um, Pharisee of Pharisees, all of the kind of things that you would put on a CV and say, this is who I am. I'm pretty impressive. Listen to me. But instead, in most of his letters, I think with one exception, Paul starts out and says, hey, you want to know who I am? I'm a slave of Jesus. And now think about that for a moment. In a culture in which slaves had no rights, no rights, that's how he starts. I'm a slave. Uh, to whom? To the Lord Jesus. And that's his credential. That's his authority. And I swim in a world, I swim in a culture, and many of you do as well, that is so oriented towards even just the way Sarah introduces me, how many articles I've written, how many books I've done, and so on. And, and what would it be like for a professor with my resume, for any of us with the resumes that we have, to be introduced and say, you know who you're going to hear from? A person who's a slave. A slave to Jesus. That is, follows Jesus so much, is so wedded to the concept of following the Lord Jesus, that all these other credentials really don't mean much. You can ask about them, but I'm not going to start there. And so, in the context of Paul's view of liberty, and he is the apostle of liberty. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Books have been written about this. But nonetheless, his starting point is, I belong to Jesus. That's my credential. And I find that both sobering and I find it exciting. I long to be with people. I learn from people. I say, you know, my credential is, is grace. That's pretty much it. Uh, and so where does that lead to me? I'm a follower of Jesus. All these other things I do, I do nuclear physics. I'm a mom with six kids and all of those other major accomplishments. But the starting point is where is your identity rooted? And out of that, you then become free to follow Jesus. So Paul, I think, has a very dense, deep concept of freedom, and it would be lost on many libertarians who have not rooted themselves in the scriptures, who believe that freedom is essentially my way. And as I said, I think that's the great divide between people like myself, who place great value on individual liberty. But the question then, is freedom to do what? Is it to do what God would plan us, God designed us to do? Or is it to take a very alternative route, which many secular libertarians take and relish and can defend with, with great vigor, that I'm free to be who I want to be as I identify myself? That, to a Christian, is a false freedom. Another question of comparing, contrasting, reconciling, really. How, how do you reconcile equality in God's love with inequality in market outcomes, like wages? It seems that uh, many Christians find this contradictory. It could be, it could be equal yeah. in God's love, but unequal outcomes. Well, I think there's nothing in the Christian faith that really says there will be equal Outcomes, even when you think about the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I mean, remarkable gifts that the church benefits from, the church depends upon the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit endows people with these gifts, it's not like everybody gets the same gift. In fact, the Bible's quite clear on this, that there will be different gifts for the benefit of the body. So everybody is not a hand. Everybody is not an ear. People have different functions, different callings. And if the outcome of that from economics is that one person makes a higher wage than another person, I just think in God's economy, that is not a very big deal. It may be a very big deal in a world in which an ideology, in my view, a false ideology, promotes the ideal that everybody should have an equal wage. I mean, one could make the same case with everybody should have the same house or everybody should have the same appearance. Uh, we, we, we find great diversity in God's creation. There was right from the start. He didn't start with one day and make one thing and say, okay, I'm done. 
even in the creation, there was diversity and that there's diversity in market outcomes, diversity in gifts and talents. That to me seems to go back to scriptural precepts that one would expect. Now, that's not to say, it is not to say that free markets by themselves, unfettered free markets, will lead to results that are utopia. Not at all. We're in a fallen world. And so the burden, I think, comes upon Christians who observe the unfortunate plight of others to come alongside and help them. And the free market gives us the liberty to do that. One of my greatest concerns, it's a very hard thing to explain to my students, one of my greatest concerns about the welfare state is that it will, to use an econ term, crowd out charity. Mm -hmm. That is, if the current generation of my students comes to believe that it is the state's job to take care of someone who is in their neighborhood who is ill or who has lost a job or some tragedy has happened, if that is the state's job, it will in a fallen world, crowd out our other desire, our intention. It will squelch the intention for us to come alongside and do that. And two things are lost when that happens. First of all, the person who has had the tragedy occur loses the benefit of that love and help and assistance. But that's not the full tragedy. The full tragedy is that the person who would otherwise have given that loses, loses the sensitivity of coming alongside and being Christ's person to that neighbor, to that individual. So to love your neighbor is basic to the Christian faith. But if you're raising a culture of young people that loving your neighbor is the state's job, then the sensitivity for us to love our neighbor will, I believe, be squelched. Thank you. That's all cool. We have, um, we have a question more on social issues and, and whether you can offer a perspective on, on what C.S. Lewis might think on this. The, the question reads, on social issues, libertarians seem closer to liberals, um, maybe progressives is what they mean, um, than conservatives. How would C.S. Lewis consider legislating on social issues like life, marriage, etc.? We, to, to answer the question directly, we don't really know because Lewis, um, if, if you were to go to Lewis, C.S. Lewis, and, and I'm imagining this, but I'll say this with some confidence. If you were to, from, from reading a lot of Lewis, if you were to go to Lewis and say, what should be the marginal tax rate on rental property from a Christian perspective? He would have thought the question was nonsense. There would be no Christian perspective mm. on that. So, and, and so that's why Lewis is able to step back. And he really did step back from many of the things that, that policy wonks live and die for. My recollection is that he didn't even like read the daily papers because he thought what was the, the really important thing to know were the internal verities. And, and so the, the fine tuning of what is taught in schools of public policy I think Lewis would say, I have no interest in that, and I have no particular skill. But we do know from the quotations that I read is he was very concerned about the state coming in and directing the lives of families, from their education to the raising of their children to their homes. And in that sense, Lewis would have been opposed to what a lot of the modern welfare state does in this country and, and in the West generally. Mm -hmm. Clearly would have been opposed to that. He saw it coming. He wrote against it. And I read a number of quotes that mm -hmm. illustrate his views. There are others besides what I quoted. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, it seems your talk tonight does a, a good bit of kind of bridging disciplinary boundaries, right? Stepping outside of what people might narrowly think of as, as um, economics. Um, to draw people into conversation. I, I'm, I'm thinking of um, maybe difficulties we have talking across the economics theology divide, and certainly Acton makes huge inroads in this area and members of the faculty represented here tonight as well. What do you think the challenges are to um, talking to Christians more broadly and, and maybe theologians more narrowly about markets and, and um, 
opening up their uh, willingness to consider markets as, as a, a source or, or something that helps perceive human yeah. flourishing. So Sarah, I'm going to respond to that question at two different levels. One is there are very few organizations like Acton that have a legitimate conversation between questions of theology and questions mm -hmm. of economics. Now, some of you may not realize, if you're here, how rare this mm -hmm. is, that, that what has been created in the Acton Institute, I, I won't go so far as to say it's unique because it's not, but it is unusual. It is unusual. So I, I'm regularly invited to conferences on, quote, religion and economics. Uh, and, and, and oftentimes I'm invited as sort of the token evangelical economist. Um, and uh, there may be other people there who are interested in religion, but they're not evangelicals. They may not even be believers. They're interested in religion as a social institution, and they're interested in public policy. And, and what I find, and now I'm moving to the second part of my response, what I find, and this will come across as borderline petulant probably, so let me just apologize for that. I'm trying to <laughs> say it in a word that doesn't come off as petulant. When I go to these conferences, the people who are theologically oriented expect me to know theological writings. They expect me to know the Bible and many other writings of theologians. And like a number of economists who are in this room, we make an effort to try and read that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's hard going. It's tough sledding for us. It's not our discipline. But we read it because we're at a conference and we're interested in the intersection of religion and allocation of resources or economics. So what I find is that often, there are exceptions, but often at these conferences, the people who represent the theological side, the religious studies side, know nothing about economics, or very little. And if you ask them, have you ever had a course in economics? No. Have you ever had a course in intermediate price theory? No. What is that? <laughs> and so I've often wanted, and here's the petulant side, to be able to say, look, if you expect me to read the Bible, and if you expect me to read various theologians, and to know Niebuhr and sphere sovereignty and all this sort of thing, I expect you to go to your local college and take a course in intermediate price theory. And then let's talk. And we can have a dialogue that is truly interdisciplinary. Um, now, I, I'm not holding my breath that that would happen, but it is refreshing to come to Acton because here there's a legitimate inquiry by people who's vocational calling is that of clergy and the study of religion and theology and the Bible. And they're interested in learning about economics. Um, my pastor, my former pastor, um, uh, we had a kind of a funny conversation one time. He had read a book. It's available out in the book, Acton Bookstore, I was happy to see, by a wonderful Christian economist named Brian Fickert, who's at the Chalmers Center, a little center at a little Christian college called Covenant College. Uh, Brian is a thoroughly trained economist, Ph.D. from Yale, um, and he wrote a book called When Helping Hurts. And my pastor read this book. And I asked him, I was surprised because he had no interest in reading economics. He said, well, I have read it because so many people in the congregation were reading it, and I felt I needed to read it. But it's the only book he's read by an economist, and he read it almost out of the shame that so many people in his congregation were asking him about it. So there is this, not that most economists are great Bible scholars and students of theology, but a lot of us who are in the Association of Christian Economists, we make a real effort. Sarah does this. I know this. And there are people here at this conference who are trained in economics at top universities and who make a sincere effort to understand the Christian faith, not just as a follower of Jesus, but to understand the academic side of that. But it is rare, and that's why Acton University is so important, it is rare to find people on the theologically trained side who have an interest and will go through the hard work of learning economics. Economics is hard. It is. It is. Thank you for that. Um, perhaps because we um, 
I think might all agree that uh, free exchange of ideas is valuable and ACT and certainly stands for that. Maybe I can offer one last question that pushes back a little bit on something you said. You, you said that no one was killed by Adam Smith's invisible hand. This question, question reads, it says, what about those who say the invisible hand invites greed and um, gives incentive to hurt others for gain? Yeah, that's, I think, there's a lot of debate you can have about market systems. And I know that people who are anti-market will, will put so many chips on this idea that the market system is based on greed or causes greed. And I almost want to say to them, can't you come up with a better argument than that? Uh, because it's just, there, there are better arguments. But to put all your chips over on the market system causes greed is in my mind, especially if you're a, if you if you if you know anything at all about the Christian faith, mm -hmm. you know that the sin of greed predates market capitalism. I mean, it predates it by a long, long time. I mean, that sin has been around for years. And I will also say this: that criticism of markets is never made by people who lived under central planning. Mm -hmm. Because people who live under central planning saw and were affected directly by the greed of the bureaucrats, the greed of those who had control. Central planning does not eliminate the, the, the sin of greed. It simply redirects it and gives it to people who have a lot of power mm -hmm. uh, to exercise that particular human malady which is universal to the human race. It is not unique to market capitalism, nor is it unique to central planning. The cure to greed is not an economic system, not at all. The cure to greed is a changed heart. And that changed heart, according to the Christian faith, comes when the Holy Spirit does a work in our heart. It doesn't come from reading a book. I think that's a perfect last word. Would you all join me in thanking Ken once again? As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Jaja. <laughs>